coming up on Garden Talk. It can strengthen anything from trichomes to stems to your leaves. It strengthens everything on your plant. I'm not going to lie. I always follow the directions on the packaging. It's a good baseline. When it's an already mixed inert soil, I mean, it's really rare for something to be too hot to handle a seedling or a clone or really anything. I just open up the lid. There'll be condensation, there'll be moisture, and you put your hand in the soil, it's actually going to be warm. That's still cooking. You got to wait another week. It's worth every dollar. I highly suggest if you guys are into organic growing in any capacity, indoor, outdoor, grab one of those. I would rather that it got disturbed and replenished than nothing happening at all. It's always a better option. Doing nothing is never the right idea. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk podcast. This is episode number 47. In this episode, I interview Green Lantern. He has been gardening for 13 years and grows plants such as bamboo, house plants, medicinal plants, bonsai trees, and more. In this episode, he talks about a variety of organic gardening methods. In particular, he talks about building soil, feeding organic amendments, KNF, IPM, and more. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this podcast. They sent me over their grow tent which has a canvas density of 2000D, making them the thickest grow tent on the market today. It has an aluminum plate that mounts your controller to the grow tent with a lightproof pass-through for cable routing. The frame has 50% thicker steel poles and carries two times more weight than the standard grow tents. Coupon code MrGrowIt will get you a discount on their products, and I'll leave a link to their website down in the description section below. Dutch Pro is a sponsor of the podcast. Coupon code MrGrow10DP will get you a discount on their products. They are a plant fertilizer company that has been around for over 30 years. They originated in Amsterdam, and their nutrients are available in several countries across the world. They have everything needed for proper plant nutrition, from base nutrients to additives and pH regulators. I will leave a link to Dutch Pro's Amazon store down in the description section below. And don't forget to use coupon code MrGrow10DP for a discount on their products. All right, we're back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Green Lantern. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, man? Doing good. Good. Thanks for asking. We're going to get right into things today. We've got so much to talk about, so much good stuff to talk about. We're going to get into mixing soils. We're going to get into feeding. We're going to get into a little bit into KNF. So action-packed episode that we have today. Really excited for this one. First, what I usually do with all the guests is introduction. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into gardening? Yeah, my name's uh, Green Lantern, or Jacob uh, is my real name. And uh, I got into gardening uh, a long while back just as uh, something fun to do, really. I really enjoyed the medicinal properties of the medical plants. And uh, at first it was just because it was fun. And then, you know, years later I had a lot of back issues uh, happen. I had a car accidents and I was overweight back got all messed up and formed an S in my spine and they call that subluxation scoliosis and then I started using it medicinally and then I got way more interested in it started doing crazy amounts of research with uh, Green Goblin and you know now we're here that's awesome yeah Green Goblin is you know he's been on the channel before and people loved that episode we ha had with him because he was just spitting off a ton of knowledge when it comes to organics and you're right there by his side you know, growing in the same garden. So we're going to hear a lot of good techniques today. And yeah, let's start with mixing soil because I know you have a lot of good information about mixing soil in particular. So talk to us, what's in your mix and how do you mix it? So uh, our mix has kind of been building over almost a decade now. So it, it, originally it started off with maybe a few pro mix bales from back in the day. Uh, and then we started adding, you know, everything that one would need to add to build a soil. Uh, we got sphagnum peat moss. We started doing large pieces of perlite, and then we switched to uh, uh, high high porosity clay pellets. And uh, 
rice holes and uh you know just we just started messing around with different blends and i mean at at, at this point right now i'd say everything in there is sphagnum the clay pellets and uh compost that's pretty that's pretty much it what's the ratios of each and you talk about clay pellets it's something that we don't really hear people using much can you talk to us about why the clay pellets and then also the kind of the ratios of each of the things that you have in there yeah we're doing like a 30 20 uh 30 20 20 mix i would say uh you know 30 percent sphagnum meat peat moss 20 percent uh manure uh compost manures uh, and twenty percent others, which might be you know your rice hulls and your uh, clay pellets, things like that. We we started doing rice hulls a while back because they add a lot of benefit to the soil. Uh, and the only problem we had with that is it, it doesn't affect drainage as much as we wanted, uh, and they break down pretty quickly. So if you're looking for something to stay in your mix a little bit longer, the clay pellets will give you that advantage as well as add a little bit of silica to uh, your mix, which helps with so many things. Uh, ju just like uh, Dr. Bruce was talking about on the uh, last podcast, it, it can strengthen anything from trichomes to stems to your, your leaves. I mean, pretty much it strengthens everything on your plant. And then for the compost you mentioned, you said 20% compost. Is there any, do you have any tips in regards to that? Because that could be different types of compost, right? Yeah, and honestly, I suggest using whatever is the most readily available in your area. I prefer mushroom compost, but if you can't find mushroom compost, uh, I'm seeing booze blend compost in a lot of, plate, in a lot of uh, hydro shops and, and grow shops in general. Uh, I've even seen it in Home Depot before, and Booze Blend is just a, is a solid compost that you don't have to worry about too many things with it, uh, sourcing of where the materials came from, or uh, maybe it possibly having too much back guano that was sourced incorrectly. Uh, issues the, there's no issues with it that I've, I've that I've personally come across with it so if I see booze blend I'll probably grab that if I see mushroom compost somewhere I would I would a hundred percent much much rather get the mushroom compost okay so you have your 30 20 20 and then are you adding any additional amendments in there like some people will do blends right so build a soil is infamous for their craft blend we've got green sunshine company they have earth dust nutrients and they have a mixture that you initially blend in with your initial mix do you do any additional amendments on top of what you had just mentioned yes um what uh me and Gr what me and green goblin usually do there is uh, build a soil, craft blend like you're saying. Uh, if that's not around, we'll use a Dr. Earth blend. Uh, pretty much same same idea, same stuffs in it, different name brand. Uh, you can find it at Home Depot and some hydro shops around. Uh, I prefer the craft blend. It has a, a couple different ingredients and in in and in different ratios uh, that are more pref preferable for organic growing, in my opinion. But if you're in a pinch and that's the stuff that's around, it's going to do you great. Uh, but I, I, I prefer to use the craft blend and we use uh, – got to change the measurements in my head now because we switched the way we mix our soil. It's like seven gallons that fits in the uh, mixer rather. So it's like two and a half cups of that mix and then uh, we'll add some frass sometimes or uh, silica uh, if we if we notice that the last round had issues with uh, nitrogen, we'll add more compost. We'll add. It depends on what's going on with the last cycle. Okay, so as far as like ratios, specific ratios, I know we have a lot of uh, folks that are tuning in that. You know, more on the beginner side, they will kind of want to know the nitty gritty details about the exact ratios. I personally use about one cup per plant for the build a soil mm -hmm. craft blend. That's pretty I think, accurate. I think that's what it says on their instructions on their website. I think it's a third cup to one cup per plant. Are you also like with the Dr. Earth and stuff like that? Are you following the, dire the directions that they say on the packaging or are you doing something completely different? I'm not going to lie. I always follow the directions on the packaging. 
it's a good baseline. Either it's going to be maybe a little bit too much or maybe a little bit too less. But if you start with that baseline in the instructions that they've given you, it's going to be generally right around where you want it. And then you can adjust from there based off from your needs. Uh, maybe, maybe your particular cultivars of said strain just need way more nitrogen than other, other strains that you've had. Or they need way more potassium or, or whatever's going on. Then you can start minutely changing a few different things uh, in amounts of ingredients that you use to mitigate those things for maybe the next round or even top dressing on your current, pl current round of medicinal plants or any plants to get the desired result out of it. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah, I've been using, uh, you mentioned insect frass. I've used that in the past. Also alfalfa meal is another thing I've used. So oftentimes I start off with the bag soil. You know, at Fox Farm Ocean Forest soil is, is local to me as far as I might be able to pick it up locally. So I go with that. But I'll start with the Fox Farm Ocean Forest soil. And there's actually been times where I mixed in insect frass and alfalfa meal into the ocean forest. And I got a lot of people raising their eyebrows there like, ocean forest is already too hot. You should never be adding anything more than that. You're burning your seedlings. You're ruining your plants, blah, 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 blah. But I actually caught a really good result. You know, I started in one gallon containers, Fox Farm Ocean Forest Soil, put some insect frass in there and alfalfa meal. I got some really, really good results off of that first vegetation stage in the beginning there. Obviously, the nutrients deplete over time and I had to top dress in, add more nutrients in, which actually we're going to get into that, that next here. Yeah, and I think people get a little confused with this terminology of a, of a soil blend maybe possibly being too hot. Uh, in reality, if the blend has already been mixed and it's in a bag like Fox Farm, that's an inert mix. It's, it's been mixed already. Um, the hotness that we're referring to in a hot mix is is literally a temperature. It's you can feel it. You'll reach your hand into the uh, uh, your soil mix, and it's 20, 30, 40 degrees warmer. Uh, and if you do this in a tent out in the backyard, or a, a tarp rather, out in the backyard in the winter, you'll see actual steam coming off from this. It's it's that's what we're talking about when we say uh, we got to cook this soil mix. It's literally cooking. And if you were to use that soil during that process, that mix is literally too hot. It's physically too hot and nutriently too hot. And everything is just bioactively readily available. So as soon as you plant a, a seed into something like that or a clone into something like that, you're definitely going to have problems. But when, you, when it's an already mixed inert soil, I mean, it's really rare for something to be too hot to handle a, a seedling or a clone or really anything. Got it. So when you, when you do that initial mixing that you mentioned, you're letting it cook for a little while, right? So yeah. what time period are you letting? How long are you letting this cook for? So if you're doing it in batches of about 30 gallons, which I would recommend, if you're going to mix a soil, do at least 30 gallons because... You're going to use it, you're going to love it, and you're going to have to make more. For about 30 gallons, a cook time would, a good cook time would be about two weeks. Uh, and a good way to check this is, you know, a weekend, open up, a, if it's in a, I use trash cans. I use 35-gallon trash cans, uh, heavy duty. If I just open up the lid, there will be condensation, there will be moisture, and you put your hand in the soil, it's actually going to be warm. That's still cooking. you got to wait another week. Typically, two weeks is perfect. If it is going past two weeks, you probably did mix it a little too hot. In which case, I would take that one and mix it with another one, another trash can that I'd already pre-mixed that's a little less hot. And then you got like a diluted version of that original mix that's still going to be plenty potent enough to do whatever you want in vegetative or uh, flowering stage. So you're holding off until the temperature kind of goes down. Do you know what temperature would be too hot by chance? Like, are, are people taking like a temperature gun and like putting it on their pile and then saying, oh, okay, this is low enough? I would recommend that actually because during the exothermic reaction, you could get anywhere up to like 130 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very warm. Like, that's why I like to use heavy-duty trash cans because 
it can get a little out of control sometimes with the amount of heat that these things can produce. And also, if you have the if you're doing this in your area where you have your grow, keep that in mind as well because it may actually increase the temperature of that room, which you may may or may not want at that time. Uh, but I would I would definitely do a temperature or I I don't I don't use temperature guns because it's so much faster for me to reach my hand in. Uh, if it's phys if the dirt is phys or soil is physically warmer than the air. That's kind of that's kind of a good sign that it's still working on some stuff, and you should wait a little bit longer. Uh, also, if you start if you start to see like white mycelium forming on the top of your soil, things are finishing out. It's it's fully cooked. You feel very safe in using that, and uh, you can feel like you did a really well, well, really good job. Because when that's showing up, you know you've got the microbes and the mycorrhizal life that you wanted to create in the in your mix in the first place sounds like some good general guidelines there now for the two week period that you're letting the soil cook are you going in there i know you said you had a, a top on the container are you going in there and doing like any type of aeration like taking the top off once a day like fanning it are you turning the pile at all are you doing any of that or are you just letting it sit uh i just let it sit I do have a couple holes poked in the lids of the trash cans so that it can have air gas exchange, uh, which is it, it is kind of – they're not super airtight, so you don't need to poke the hole, but it does help. Okay. And then before we actually started recording, you brought up an interesting thing is a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll lay a tarp out. And they'll put their mixture in together, right? And, and then they'll physically use their hands to mix in things. Yeah, uh, yeah. You had mentioned some downsides to that. And then you had mentioned something that you do instead, which is use a mixer. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, most certainly. Like, like you were saying, the, I was doing the tarp method for years. And I would, uh, I would get a whole bunch of uh, expended pots onto the tarp. And I'd break them all up. And I'd put all the amendments on there. And I'd put more compost on there and i just start folding this tarp and it's hundreds of pounds at that point you got to add water and then it's getting heavier eventually it was just too back breaking uh we started looking into like alternatives and we found uh cement mixers were amazing at mixing soil because they can handle super heavy loads they can handle wet temp wet high temperature low temperature uh, everything. And we're like, shoot, we're going to give that a try. We grabbed one that's not very big. I would maybe recommend getting one just a little bit bigger than I have. It fits about seven gallons, but all the work is taken out of, out of my hands and I'm getting a way more thorough mix because there's just no, no possible way that you're going to have enough energy and strength to mix that much as much as a concrete mixer can in that amount of time. So I, I get to save a whole bunch of time and a whole bunch of labor, which is a, a big reason why I got into organic growing. I, I'm a little lazy, and I like to take long periods where I don't have to do a whole bunch of physical labor. And to take one more thing out of the line of things, especially moving and mixing soil, shoot, it's worth every dollar. I highly suggest if you guys are into organic growing, in any capacity, indoor, outdoor, you just want to make your own mix for anything, grab one of those. It'll say it'll save your back, I'm telling you. How much do they cost? Ours I believe was like three hundred. Uh it wasn't super outrageous and I think that's what also turned us on to it was, you know, three hundred can be a lot at one point in time, but it's gonna save me countless hours of work and maybe even a few chiropractor visits. <laughs> and then what are the dimensions on it? I don't know if you, you mentioned the actual dimensions, just so people at home, if they're wondering, you know, is it something you can keep in your grow room or, you know, is it more garage or backyard type size? It's it's like a two point, you can keep it in your garage or in a basement very easily. Uh, the drum fits about seven gallons. I want to say they called it like a 3.7 liter because they're talking about cement terms here. Uh and it's it's super easy to use. It's got all it has is an on and off button, one plug. Uh, the handle is retracting, so you just retract the handle out and you dump it with it on, and it pushes all the dirt into your container. And 
you're done. And that's it. It's super duper simple. Anybody could run one, and it just saves so much work. It's been a godsend. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check that out. Maybe I'll buy one for the future. Yeah, they're super portable. They come on a, on two wheels. You can you can roll them around, put them in the corner, take it out only when you need to get your job done. It's 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 become a must have in the grow room for me. For sure. All right, so moving along. So they have their soil mixed up. They ready to plant. They plant. What size containers do you generally recommend? Like I think you mentioned seven gallon containers. Are you in larger containers? And then when does that first feeding actually happen? So I would recommend maybe starting in a seven and moving to a 15 if you're going to want to do like a midway transfer, a mid mid transplant, or just going straight to the 15 if you don't want to deal with that and add the extra stressor. Uh, it's kind of crucial to have that surface area in an organic uh, setting so that you so that I, I call them batteries. They're soil batteries. If you got a 15 gallon soil battery, it's going to have enough juice to supply that plant for all the way through the vegetative state and maybe a few weeks into flower. At that point, you're going to want a top dress. Uh, you're going to want to start using some compost teas. I like to use them once a week during like the first three to four weeks of flower because there's a huge, a, a huge uptake of nutrients and they're shooting up sometimes double their size to three times their size in the flower room after the flip. And that takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of nutrients. And it's safe to say that a good 60 to 70% of the stuff that you thought was there is been eaten, has been eaten up by that point in time. Um, <clears throat> if you are doing seven gallon pots uh, and you just don't have the room to do 15 or 10 gallon pots, it just means you got to do a couple more top dressings. I would top dress halfway through vegetative stage. Uh, if your veg if your veg period is usually six weeks, let's say, or four weeks, you know, do do a top dress at two weeks in, and then top dress right before it goes in the flower. Um, and you should be pretty solid. Okay, so if you're trying to make it very as easy as possible, 15 gallon containers, literally plant in there. You don't have to do your first feeding or, or top dressing until. The flowering stage is what you mentioned, several weeks into the flowering stage, which is awesome. I've just been using these seven gallon containers right now, and I've been doing exactly kind of what you just mentioned is there are feedings within the vegetation stage. I'm doing a top dressing within the vegetation stage. It's usually what I'll do is I'll do about 30 days, then I'll, 20 to 30 days, then I'll do a top dressing. And then shortly after that, I'm usually flipping to flower. And then from there, I will do another top dressing, roughly 20, 30 days into flower. And that usually gets me through the grow. And that's in seven gallon containers. But, you know, you make me want to actually switch to a larger container because then I'll have to do less feedings, right? It's worth it's worth it in the long run. Uh, and it, it usually ends up equaling out. I'm always worried, you know, maybe if I do that, I, I'm not going to be able to run as many uh, plants and, and my harvest isn't going to be what it needs to be. Uh, but typically when you're running bigger pots, you're going to get a bigger plant and you'll get that heart, that same harvest that you were thinking of just with less plants. And it's gotten me so convinced that I'm starting to think maybe I should move up to 30 gallons and, and do half the amount of plants. But I got to really convince Goblin about that. That would be a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> So when you're doing the, the let's say let's say you need to feed in veg, right? What are you feeding in veg? Um, in in veg, I really would just do a light top dressing of the craft blend or the Doctor Earth blend that we were talking about earlier, uh, and just kind of let it do its work. Uh, water it in a little bit, let it let it take off. If if I'm noticing that that's not enough uh, for a certain plant, then I'll probably add some worm castings and a little bit of, uh, compost if I've got some extra from mixing soil. And that just kind of re, it, it's like recharge. It reactivates the microbial life and kind of gives it a kick in the butt and say, Hey, wake up and start delivering nutrients to this plant. And then when you get into flowering, are you doing any different type of feeding or is it the same exact thing that you just mentioned that you do for veg? Yeah, same exact thing. Uh, we might add a little bit of, like, if we're doing a compost tea, you might add a little bit of sugar. I don't like to go too hard on the sugar because most everything 
uh, about the mix and, and what you're doing in organic growing is to get that microbial life to to be alive and to, and to multiply. And it, it can get a little too hardcore if you start going crazy with molasses or sugar. So use, I use that sparingly. And that's probably, that's pretty much the only other thing I add. I'll, you know, when I'm doing compost teas, we'll do the same stuff that's in the, in the soil mix, the booze compost, the little bit of, little handful of craft blend. Uh, when I say handful, I literally mean I'll grab a handful and that's it. And I use a 30 gallon, uh, 35 gallon trash cans for everything I do. It keeps all the metrics the same. So my uh, water reservoirs, 35 gallons. The soil batteries that I just made, 35 gallons. Everything adds up, and I don't have to do a whole bunch of math on thinking, maybe I didn't make this here tea strong enough. There's no, I don't have, it, I've, I've been doing it for so long that I've taken a lot of the measurements out and just started using what what works for the containers that I have because nothing – if the container doesn't change, you know exactly what you're dealing with. They mentioned worm castings and compost. I know microbes are going to come along with that. There's so many microbial inoculants on the market today. You also mentioned recharge. Do you use any of the micro products to inoculate the medium at any point in the grow, whether it be, you know, recharge or mammoth pea or, or any of the micro products out there? Not always. Uh, if I have some around, I will, I'll do it cause it's a big benefit. It, it is going to help. I mean, there's no, there's no reason not to use it if you have it around. If you don't have it around, I also wouldn't feel too bad about it. You can mitigate that process. Like we were saying with, with your composts and your, uh, with your manures and with your worm castings and pretty much any other type of castings. Uh, so I don't worry about it too much, but if I do have it around, so it's a blessing. I'll use it, and it, it speeds things up. Uh, you'll notice, I've at least I've noticed an increase in growth, uh, in the increase in in the speed of growth when I use products like that. I wouldn't rely on them solely because I'm trying to get away from relying on products, but also it's great to have something to run to like that. It's the the convenience of it is amazing. You also briefly talked about compost teas. So you do aerated compost teas throughout the grow. Can we get deeper into that a little bit? Uh, wondering when you apply the compost teas. I know it's going to add in a lot of beneficial bacteria, microbes that are needed to help break down those amendments, uh, you know, help with nutrient uptake, speed up growth, so on and so forth. How often are you doing these compost teas and, and, and what's your process for brewing? So I like to do compost teas when I'm noticing that the uh, plant battery is running out of juice, and you'll 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 notice this with the way your plant's behaving. It might be uh, praying one day, and then the next day you got a couple yellow leaves, and everything's hanging down, and it just the plant looks sad, doesn't look happy happy anymore. Uh, that's a good sign that it's time to recharge up some of those microbes, and to do that. The easiest way for a lot of people, including myself, is a compost tea. Uh, I like to take a five-gallon bucket with two very large air stones. Uh, and I have a Micron filter bag meant for compost teas. I'll throw my ingredients in there. Uh, typically like a cup of booze blend, a handful of craft mix, uh, maybe a little bit of sugar. And we'll throw that. We'll throw one air stone in the bag and one air stone in the bucket with the uh, mostly full of water you know it's 90 percent full of water and we'll leave that there for 16 to 20 hours i find if i go past 24 or into the 48 it's starting to get a little too anaerobic in a sense uh for lack of a better word and i'd rather use it when it when it has all that fresh new life that just came out and it's ready to work gotcha now, I was going to ask you about nutrient teas as well, but it looks like that's your, you know, that compost tea that you mentioned, you're adding in nutrients, right? You said you're adding in some craft blends and stuff like that. Yeah. And so some of those, I assume, are going to be water soluble. Others aren't going to be water soluble. So do you take that bag and then put it, you know, top dress your soil with it or, or what do you do? Um, I use, yeah, I, honestly, I'll take what's left of that bag and I'll put it back into my soil mix. 
uh, and just kind of mix it back in. And whatever whatever's left is only going to benefit that soil mix now. All right. How about seed sprouted teas? Do you use uh, utilize those at all or no? Uh, me and Gollum have not really used them that much. Uh, we have tried it out, you know, just as a just as a kind of science experiment. But I'm I'm pretty interested in it. It's kind of it's kind of more new to me. So I'd like to try it out in a more controlled setting. Maybe pick a tent and those ones are going to get that and everything else won't kind of thing and just just see what happens but no it was a uh, it, it's a it's a fascinating idea and i started looking more into it once uh once you'd brought it up and it's kind of, it, it's kind of fascinating to germinate a bunch of these seeds and juice them up and then feed them back to your plants it's it's a crazy idea that just might work absolutely let's move on to mulch layers so definitely key to use, you know, especially when you're growing organically, you need to make sure that the that top layer is moist, right? The soil needs to be moist in order to have those microbes active. And a mulch layer is one of those things that helps retain the moisture in the medium, right? What do you use for mulch layers typically? Right now, I use straw. Uh, it's pretty easy to deal with, you know, and it does an excellent job of trapping moisture on that top layer so that things don't dry out. But it's kind of a pain in the butt in a way as well and i'm i'm exploring a different ideas maybe uh maybe even like a non-organic idea maybe something like uh that th those sheets that they put on gardens outdoors something that's just a little less messy cuz when you go back to i need to take the this soil and mix it again You've got a whole bunch of straw that you've got to deal with. And some of it is in big pieces, which is awesome. You can grab that pretty easy. And some of it is kind of shredded or, or now decaying. And it it becomes a problem for me because I'm super OCD when it comes to mixing the soil. And I only want the things that I put in the soil in the soil. <laughs> but it works. it works excellent. And besides, you know, getting a little OCD about cleanliness... It's it's probably one of the best uh, options for a mulch layer, in my opinion. I've been using barley straw as a mulch layer as well, and yeah, it's pretty easy to use for sure. You know, when I am doing that top dressing, I am lifting it up and putting those amendments underneath the layer and kind of mixing in the soil underneath that layer. Um, sometimes I'm actually removing them entirely and then putting the amendments up top and mixing them in and then reapplying. Now, some people would probably probably say I'm disturbing the microbe life a little bit by removing that layer and then re-adding it, but... They might, they might. I mean, it might be, but I'm not going to lie. We do the same thing. I, I, you got to lift that up and you got to, sometimes you got to move some soil around and, and really mix it in there. Uh, I would rather that it got disturbed and replenished than nothing happening at all. Uh, that's always a better option. Doing nothing is never the right idea. Let's move on to cover crops. Can you talk to us about cover crops a little bit and what you do for them? Yeah, right now we're not using any cover crops, uh, but they can be very beneficial, especially in determining signs of deficiencies uh, before the plant is actually being harmed because uh, those cover crops are going to be the first ones to see see the signs of, a, of a, any type of deficiency. Uh, I think... It's very smart to use a wide variety of cover crops. I see a lot of people picking one and sticking with it, uh, and that'll just be the cover crop on every plant in in every pot, which is convenient. It's easier. I'll give you that much. But I think if you had a mixture, then you could see different traits of, of different deficiencies in different ways on different cover crops, giving you a little wider spectrum of information. Uh, and more benefits because once the, a lot of these different cover crops degrade differently when they die off, which giving you different types of nutrients. And maybe you thought that this cover crop was going to give you more potassium, but it actually gave you way too much phosphorus. And now you've got a really, really hot phosphorus in your in your mix, and you're not really sure what to do at that point. That That's the only worry I have with cover crops is just – if you are going to use them, keep them diverse. That way, 
your soil's eating a whole diverse palette, like a buffet of different things. And that's, that's all everybody wants, really. Gotcha. Definitely some good advice there for sure. Okay, so uh, they've mixed their soil, they've grown their plant, they're either using mulch layers and cover crops or they're not. They're using compost teas, uh, top dressing when needed. They've got through their growth successfully. What do you do with that 15-gallon container? Are you removing it from that container and then re-amending and then putting it back in your concrete mixer? Or are you keeping that container and just doing kind of like a no-till style to where you're just replanting directly into that container, re-amending, and so on and so forth? Um, <clears throat> a good 99% of the time, I'm pulling them and I'm going to mix them with the concrete mixer. If I had a rare case where I noticed that the mix was hot all the way through, I didn't have to top dress in the flower stage, and I wasn't doing very many compost teas, and I, everything still went fine, then I'm going to take those specific uh, pots, and I'll replant directly in them. I'll pull the stalk right out, and I'll replant in them for the veg, and then that round, uh, you'll have to keep an eye on a little bit, little bit more, and you might have to do more top dressings and more feedings on on that specific round, but it'll save you a bunch of work if you're dealing with with large numbers. Uh, sometimes it's nice to be able to take ten or twelve that are already hot enough to handle a veg period and just replant in them. Gotcha. I was just curious on that one what you did because I know there's a couple different ways to go about it for sure. Let's go into KNF. So I think there's probably be quite a few people here that are interested in knowing about KNF. That's not something that we've talked about yet on the podcast. I haven't really had any guests that really talked about KNF. So let's just get a little bit into it today. Maybe in the future I can have somebody on here to talk a full blown episode with KNF. I know you just do a little bit of KNF. Can you talk to us about you know what is KNF and then what are some of the KNF methods that you practice? So KNF just stands for Korean Natural Farming. Uh, it's a it's a way of organically growing uh, in a, in making your own amendments. Uh, a lot of people are dependent. Most of us are dependent on going to a store and buying our own amendments, whether that's uh, a nutrient line or or even organic uh, amendments that are dried out. And to to get away from that, you can start exploring the land of KNF and uh, Master Chow is the guy that in, in, kind of invented it or coined it or or whatever you want to whatever you want to say and he shows you a plethora of different ways to make things like fermented plant juice and uh, labs and you can essentially replace everything you're doing with natural products that you can make at home Okay, and then what do you typically do for KNF? Uh, can't the only KNF that I've personally messed with uh, is like fermented plant juice. Uh, I have tried to make a few IMO boxes. I'm still looking for the right area for it. Uh, and IMO is where you take a sticky form of rice. Uh, you 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 cook up some rice. You get a sticky rice and you put it in a, a box, literally, and you cover it up with a paper towel put it out in the forest where you where you see there's a high microbial life and you hope that that rice gets inoculated by the naturally occurring funguses that are in that forest and then you do some more there's like eight, 18 more processes and I'm just a beginner in KNF so I don't know exactly what happens after that but you know I, that's the stuff that I've been practicing so far and it's a, it's a really fascinating world to dive into because it starts getting into the specifics of exactly what's scientifically happening when you feed your soil and when the plant is uptaking nutrients from the things that you've given it. With organics, you kind of take a step back and you're, you're just kind of mixing things together and letting nature take its course. And then with KNF, in my opinion, it starts diving back into the territory where you're in full control. And you know exactly what each product's for and what's happening when you give that product and and why. That's so cool. Yeah, a whole different rabbit hole to go down, you know. I mentioned this in far too many of my videos, but there are so many different ways to grow this plant, you know. And KNF is another method to grow it. 
Yeah, I, uh, I was just uh, watching some of Chris Trump's videos. Uh, if you guys are interested in learning more in KNF, I, I highly suggest checking out some of those videos. They're very informative, and they'll kind of go step by step in explaining what's going on with KNF and why it's really important. I've heard his name quite a few times. I heard he's an excellent resource for KNF. Super smart, super smart individual. Let's uh, let's talk about one more thing. IPM. You know, I, sometimes I feel like we should talk about this first. You know, pest pest yeah. prevention, right? What do, what do we do to what do we do to prevent pests? I know you grow organically. You know, all natural. What is your IPM routine? So first things first. Uh, the best IPM routine that you can keep in an organic garden is make sure your your soil batteries are moist always. That's going to be your first step. Uh, the second step is I love to use Jadam. It's a wetting agent uh, and it kind of follows along the same lines as KNF, just a different category of learning in, in, in practice. And it works so well as a disinfectant. It has a super widespread covering of the leaves. Uh, it's super easy to coat both sides of the leaves in it doesn't have any downsides that I've seen. It's a it's a natural disinfectant. It degrades off the plant naturally uh, within a few days. So I've I've used it all the way through flower even, and not noticed a difference in my product, the way it tastes, the way it smells, and it's just gener generally a great idea to have around. If that if that's not enough, then I'll start adding neem seed oil and lavender to the to the jadam so that not only is it getting that awesome widespread coverage but it has more insect uh, repellent and management ingredients in it that are going to be more effective because of that spray how often do you spray and at what point in the day do you spray so if i'm having pest issues i'll spray every day if i'm not having pest issues i'll spray twice to three times a week uh and and more often in the veg if i'm not spraying with jadam i'll just spray with just plain water uh in the veg and just the act of of getting the leaves moist and then them drying out is enough to kill certain insects in and their eggs so that practice alone can just save you a whole bunch of time and I usually using it like before lights on or um, yeah. throughout the day. Okay. Yeah, especially in flower, uh, I spray I spray before the lights are on, probably twenty minutes before. I'll go in there in the dark and just kind of feel the plant while I'm spraying it, which is another good way to ensure you're spraying the bottoms of the leaves. So if you grab uh, a stalk and you just kind of spray in your hand while you're moving up the stalk you know you're getting every leaf all the way up that stalk, even in the dark. Uh, that's just kind of a trick I picked up after years of spraying plants, but it, it's very effective. And it's going to dis physically disturb, if there are eggs or actual pests on the bottoms of those leaves, it will physically disturb them and remove them, essentially. I think a lot of people will spray during veg, you know, sometimes it's once a week. I know you, you said every day you're spraying. And then you mentioned flowering as well. I know a lot of people will stop spraying and flowering because they don't want any of this on their buds or flowers at all. Are you, do you spray and flower as well? Uh, I will only the jadam, only the jadam. Uh, that's the only thing I'll spray and flower. And that's only because it, it naturally degrades within two to three days. Uh, at first, I was highly skeptical of doing that in flower, and I was just like everybody else. You know, I was super worried that it was going to affect the product in in any way, and that's not cool. Not cool with me. Uh, we gave it a shot on the last couple, and nothing nothing bad happened. I I mean, we it, even if you have a pest issue during flower, and that's why we really wanted to try it. If you have a pest issue during flower, you don't have a lot of options. You know, you can you can get some green lace wigs, you can get some predatory mites, you can there's like only a few things you can do without severely degrading your product. And I was hoping that that could be one more thing we could add to our list uh to maybe save some plants in the future that were not as lucky.
So are you only spraying in flower if you see an issue or yeah. are you, okay. Only if you, okay. I wasn't only sure if you were still doing it as a preventative everyday spraying through a flower or not. No, no, that'd be just, <laughs> that'd be so much work in, and it's not, if you're having that much of a problem, it's not a practical solution. Uh, and then I just, I would have, I would, I would drop the Jadam thing a while ago, but it, <laughs> but it, it is a good solution in it's super duper cheap it's super effective uh we actually have a video on green goblin 510 showing you how to make it yourself uh and it is available on the green goblin 510 website as well if you just want to give it a shot to see if it'd be worth it uh in your garden uh or worth it for you to make it and that's gonna help repel or battle off tons of pests right i mean are we talking spider mites aphids things like that or, or oh yeah what? we're talking spider mites aphids thrips uh you name it it's 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 a powerful disinfectant and it dry it's a it's a soap in reality so it dries out the exoskeletons of said bugs uh if the bug doesn't have an outer exoskeleton it's even it's going to work even better so it really doesn't have a downside, and if you use it as intended, and you and you mix it as intended, you'll dilute it in a in your in your IPM regimen. You know, there's no reason not to use it, man. It saved me so many headaches in in pest management that I can't speak highly of it enough. That's awesome, man. We have a lot of good information in this video. You know, we talked about mixing soil, we talked about feeding, we touched on compost teas, mulch layers cover crops, KNF, IPM, a whole bunch of things were packed into this episode. Yeah. Really appreciate your time today. Tell us, how can the listeners find you? And then uh, what do you have upcoming in the future? Uh, so if you're trying to find me, you can find me on Green Goblin 510, uh, the YouTube channel, as well as Twitch, Green Goblin 510. Me and Goblin are always streaming over there as much as we can, getting some games in, answering some girl questions. Uh, as well as if you're looking to listen to some music in the garden, I got a bunch of that on SoundCloud under Lantern Beats. And uh, the only thing I got coming up is more grow videos and more music. Awesome. Well, I'll definitely link your channel down in the YouTube description section below. If you enjoyed this video, click that thumbs up button. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. I release these episodes every single weekend. And then if you're tuned in on one of the podcast platforms, uh, particularly Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating and review. Green Lantern, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. This has been awesome. I totally appreciate your time. Not a problem. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Thank you so much.